Hello everyone, my name is Salome Funes. I'm a graduate student at the Neurology Department at UMass Medical School. And today we are gonna discuss chapter 15 of the Brain Facts that talks about neurodegenerative diseases. We are gonna, there is plenty of neurodegenerative diseases, but today we are gonna focus on four of them. Alzheimer's, Parkinson, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and Huntington's disease. But first, it's important to understand why we want to study neurodegenerative diseases. So thanks to all the new medical treatments that we have available, it is estimated by, that by 2060, around 15% of the US population is going to have 16 years old or more. We also know that neurodegenerative disorders affect 50% of all people of that age which results in around 15 million Americans will have some form of neurodegeneration by 2016. So as we can see as the population age, it's becoming more and more important to understand this type of disorders to provide uh, treatments and solutions to the increasing number of patients. The first a neurodegenerative disorder that we're gonna talk about is a Alzheimer's disease. This is the most common form of dementia among the elderly. It affects five to 8% of the population with an age of 65, but it affects nearly to 50% of people with age of 85 years or more. Currently, it affects around 5 million of Americans. And people such as Rosa Park and Ronald Reagan suffer from this disease. It's known as the sixth uh, leading cause of death. However, since uh, multiple times uh, the estimate number could not be known or reported appropriately, it is thought that it could be even as the third cause of death. Um, the most general symptoms of Alzheimer's are forgetfulness, as you may know, disorientation of time and place, difficulty with concentration, calculations, uh, language, and judgment. And the symptoms get worse and worse as disease progresses. They are different stages of the disease that are characterized by different symptoms. Such as, for example, at the early stage, uh, the patient shows memory problems, difficulty concentrating and judging, and also finding the appropriate words to express their feelings or they thought, their thoughts, and also they have this orientation. In the mild stage, they start to show personality and behavior changes. They start to lose objects or uh, repeating the same question, placing objects in odd places, such as, for example, the toilet brush into the fridge, and they have troubles in general with their daily living. At this stage, most patients are diagnosed because the symptoms are more evident. In the moderate stage, they start to have difficulty recognizing family and friends, inability to learn uh, or, or adjust to new things. They have hallucinations, paranoia, and impulsive behavior, and sometimes they even can turn aggressive. At the severe stage, they are completely dependent on the caretakers. They have lost communication, they have a huge weight loss, and they're mostly bedridden. What are the forms of diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease do we have? Since there is not a biomarker available, and biomarker means a molecule or a protein that is characteristic of a disease, the current way to diagnose Alzheimer's is an interview with the patients and the family. And the Doctor can ask for changes in memory, concentration, disorientation, but also the medical background, such as general medical history, uh, cases of substance abuse, or family history of neurodegeneration disorders. Also the ability to perform daily tasks and the changes in behavior and personality that the family may have noticed. But what happens inside of the brain, in the cellular level that could be associated with Alzheimer's disease. So uh, 
during the development of this disease, we have a reduction of uh, markers for neurotransmitters, such as uh, acetylcholine, glutamate, the markers for those neurotransmitters are reduced. But also the axons of the synapse and the synapses are damaged in the brain. But uh, without doubt, the two chemical and cellular changes that are more characteristic of the disease are the accumulation of beta amyloid plaques and ne tau neurofibular tangles. So it's very important that you remember these two because they are very, very important. So as you can see here, this is how it looks a normal brain. But when we have an Alzheimer's patient, they are gonna have amyloid plaques that is accumulation of the amyloid protein in the extracellular space and tau neurofibular tangles. Tau is another protein that it's gonna be a accumulated forming tangles in the intracellular space, so it's inside the cell. So this protein tau uh, normally will help to maintain the skeleton of the cytoskeleton of the cell, but it has been shown that during Alzheimer's it starts to form this tangle that seems to be toxic for the cell. Uh, the beta amyloid plaques can be seen using a uh, PET scans and tracers, and they can be like badly seen in Alzheimer's disease patients, but sometimes they're also seen in a uh, normal uh, patients, but they still have these amyloid plaques. And this, you can see here how uh, amyloid negative uh, brain would look like. So although the beta amyloid plaques are a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease, sometimes patients, people that have not shown Alzheimer's disease symptoms still have some level of these plaques. Uh, also Alzheimer's disease causes more like big changes in the brain. The disease mostly affects the cortex and the hippocampus and um, because it destroys the connections between the neurons, it affects the synapses and causes cell death in the brain. And it makes the brain appear uh, shriveled. As you can see here, the cortex and the hippocampus will shrink and the ventricles are enlarged, changing the shape of a healthy brain towards an advanced Alzheimer's disease case. There are multiple uh, genetic mutations that are associated with Alzheimer's. Um, but the most uh, direct associated are the genes called presignaline 1 and 2, and also the amyloid precursor protein. These three are very important. Uh, they all, the mutations in these genes are present in early onset Alzheimer's, that is around 40 and 50s. And this amyloid precursor protein, also known as APP, is normally found in enrolled synapses and combined to receptor causing eruption, erosion of the synapses. So we, can ha we have here the APP protein normally. And this protein sometimes needs to be cut into different pieces and the enzymes that cut these pieces are encoded by the gene presignaline one and two. So once we have these pieces, one of these pieces is called the beta amyloid piece. And this piece is kind of uh, sticky and would form these amyloid plaques that at the end will accumulate in the extracellular space of the, of the cell, causing the amyloid plaques that are characteristic of the disease. It is thought that these amyloid plaques are the seeding to the, a cascade of events that at the end cause Alzheimer's disease. It is thought that these plaques would affect a tau protein state and at the end, because of this amyloid accumulation, uh, the tau protein is gonna also form these uh, neurofibular tangles. But it's not exactly known how these two processes are directly connected. There are other genes that also are associated with ALS, I mean with Alzheimer's disease, such as for example, apolipoprotein E, also known as APOE, 
Specifically, the variant Epsilon 4 is linked with a greater risk of the disease. This protein normally functions to clear amyloid beta from the brain. So it's understandable that if the protein is mutated, it could slow down the clearance of amyloid beta contributing to Alzheimer's. There's another very interesting protein called Tom 40 that uh, normally is responsible for removing proteins into the mitochondria, but it has a dual role when in the relationship with Alzheimer's disease. Because people with a longer version of this Tom4 gene shown to be either predisposed or resistant to Alzheimer's disease. They are predisposed if one of their parents have Alzheimer's disease before, but they are resistant if none of their parents has had the disease. So it is not completely understood how this Tom4 protein is related to the pathology, but it is known that it has this dual role. And another very important gene when we are discussing Alzheimer's is TREM2. This gene normally is expressed in microglia that are the immune cells in the brain that are in charge of clearing cell debris and also clearing amyloid proteins and also can a, cause inflammation. So this TREM2 Two protein is expressed mainly in microglia and it helps to regulate all these processes. So when there is mutations in this gene, eh, these mutations are also linked to the development of Alzheimer's disease. For example, the homozygous loss of function mutation, which means that we have two copies mutated of the allele, that means that there is no functional protein. This situation is associated with early onset. But um, when we have a heterozygous variant, which means one a normal copy and one mutated copy, there is an auto onset of Alzheimer's disease. For treatments, there are five drugs approved by the FDA. A, the first drug that you can see, see the name right here inhibits MDA receptors because it's gonna prevent the calcium accumulation that happens during AD inside the cell. So the Alzheimer's damaged neurons can become even more damaged by overexcitation from calcium. So this, um, this drug helps to reduce this buildup of calcium, which helps it with the neuron survival. The other uh, drugs are a cholinesterase inhibitors, which means they are gonna prevent the breakdown, breakdown of acetylcholine. And this is important because acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that it contributes with learning and memory. So using these drugs allows the brain to have more acetylcholine available and ameliorate the symptoms. There is some relief of the symptoms with this treatment, but there is not health of the disease, of course. And here there is the other three drugs that are cholinesterase inhibitors. The five approved drug is a combination of the MD8 inhibitor and one of the cholinesterase inhibitors are then prescribed depending on the stage of the disease. There are also some uh, therapies that are undergoing clinical trials that are trying to remove, remove amyloid plaques using the body's immune system and also uh, reduce the production of new amyloid plaques. And as I mentioned before, the drugs do not change the course of the disease. They only help to temporarily reduce the symptoms, but Alzheimer's disease is currently fatal. Now we're gonna talk about a Parkinson's disease. This disease approximately affects 50 to 60,000 people in the US every year. It affects more than women to, than men and has a higher incidence in developing countries. It has a different age of onsets, being the most typical form at 60 years, but also there is an early onset of 50 years where uh, it affects a 50 to 10% of the people. There is also a juvenile form uh, where uh, the onset is at the, the 20s, but it's very uh, rare. 
This uh, disorder is characterized uh, for a motor symptom, motor system failure, and is caused by loss of a uh, dopamine producing cells that are called dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra. Uh, the substantia nigra is part of the basal ganglia, and as you may remember from previous chapters, this affects the movement. This region affects the movement, reward, and addiction. So you can imagine that there is problems with voluntary movement in this disease because the cells, the dopamine neurons in this area are gonna uh, die. There are two types of symptoms uh, in Parkinson's disease, the motor symptoms and the cognitive the symptoms. The motor symptoms appear early and they are, for example, a slow movement, muscular rigidity, trouble with coordination and the uh, commonly known uh, tremors, where like people shake hands, arms, legs, and other parts of the body while at rest. The later symptoms are trouble walking, talking, and performing normal activities due to, uh, due to the rested tremor that they have. And they later on have cognitive decline uh, that uh, is marked by depression and emotional changes but they also can have other symptoms such as skin problems, constipation, urinary problems, or sleeping issues. So what is the cause of Parkinson's disease? The exact uh, cause or process in the cell that causes Parkinson's is not completely understood, but it's known that the disease is related with the accumulation of alpha synuclein tangles inside the neurons. alpha synuclein is a protein that is normally involved in dopamine transport, but during disease, it seems to form tangles that uh, with other molecules of alpha synuclein or with other proteins, which could include neurofilaments, ubiquitin, and even tau. And these tangles seem to be detrimental for the cell health. People with early onset of disease, however, have shown a mutations in a different gene, in a different protein that is called Parkin. Parkin usually plays a role in the cell machinery that breaks down and needed proteins. And it's thought that people with this mutation would have a, a disruption in this cleaning of all proteins, and that could be related to the development of Parkinson's disease. There is also, it has been suggested that are possible damages of the mitochondrial respiration process. And all these um, failures ended up with neuronal death. Uh, this disease, as well as Alzheimer's disease, it happens by a combination of a genetics and environmental factors. And only 50 to 25% of the Parkinson's disease patients have relatives that also have the disease, while all the rest, they don't have any. Regarding treatments, there, again, there are no treatments that can stop how the progression of the disease, but they could help with the symptoms. Um, the mostly a common prescribed drug is called L-DOPA, that a, uh, However, this drug has a downside that could, uh, if there is an excessive amount of L-DOPA, could cause abnormal um, uncontrolled involuntary movements. There are other type of treatment that is not uh, badly used because it's very invasive, but has been applied to some patients and it's called deep brain stimulation. This, um, in this, a treatment, a surgeon locates a patient where the patient's symptoms are originating in which brain region using an MRI or a CT scan. And then it's going to implant a, a small neurostimulator device that sends electrical impulses that would interfere and block brain signals that cause the motor symptoms. So this a procedure can correct or ameliorate a motor symptoms but it doesn't help with a cognitive decline. Other uh, treatments that have been proposed are the breakdown of alpha-synuclein tangles using high, high, hydrostatic pressure 
And also it suggested that caffeine and nicotine uh, could ameliorate or reduce some of the uh, symptoms of Parkinson's disease. However, as you may notice, there is a, a lot of unknowns and we still need some treatments for um, Alzheimer's disease, I mean for Parkinson's disease. So that's why there is a lot of research undergoing trying to find alternative therapeutics. And there is very interesting research using a molecule that is called MMPTP that when injected to monkeys, it causes a similar symptoms as Parkinson's. It causes loss of the cells in the substantia nigra and also causes cognitive deficits, but it doesn't cause motor decline. So using this compound, they have injected some mice with MPTP and they develop a Parkinson disease-like symptoms. And after that, and once they have lost the cells in the substantia nigra, they take biopsies from these monkeys, they take some fibroblasts, and fibroblasts can be reprogrammed to become inducible pluripotent stem cells. So once we have stem cells, they can pretty much be differentiated into any cell type. So these scientists have take the cells and differentiate them into a dopamine neurons. They have the dopamine neurons and they can transplant them back into the monkeys to replace the neurons that have died, be, have died because of Parkinson. And it has shown a huge recovery in the, in the monkeys. So this is an initial step, the steps for personalized cell therapy that is expected in the future help uh, many people that suffer with Parkinson's disease. The third disorder that we're going to talk about today is called amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It is also known as Lou Gehrig disease uh, because a very famous New York Yankee first baseman suffered of this disorder and he has to retire at the age of 36 and sadly died two years later. ALS is a fatal motor neuron disorder that affects about 50,000 Americans every year. It has an age onset of 50 to 60 years old. It affects more on men than to women and more to non-Hispanic white people than any other race. It prominently affects the muscle movements, but it has no effect in the cognition or in the personality. And so far there is no cure for this disease. As you may remember, Stephen Hopkins suffered of ALS. He has a very uh, rare form with an early onset. He was diagnosed at the age of 21 and was given two years to live. But as we know, he lived a, a longer life, but at the end, um, he died from the fatal effects of the disease. The most common symptoms are a muscle weakness, twitching, eventual paralysis in hand and the feet. The patients are gonna lose their strength and the ability to move, speak and eat, and they finally die because the disease affects the, the nerves of the respiratory muscles. Only 10% of the patients survive uh, 10 years, and most of them live around two to five years after disease diagnosis. ALS, is a, my favorite neurodegenerative disorder because currently in my PhD project, I'm studying this disease. As I mentioned before, these affects the motor neurons are the only neurons affected. And as you can see here, they are degenerated and they will ultimately die. Uh, there are two uh, categories of this disease, the familial and the sporadic. Familial means that there is another member in the family that already suffered the disease. And 50 to 10% of the cases are familial, uh, which are related to genetic mutations. The vast majority of the cases are sporadic, which means that there is no other relative that has the disease before. From the 50 to 10% of familial cases, 25 to 40% are due to mutations in a gene known as C9 or 72. This gene has this strange name because when it was discovered, the function was unknown. So it was just give this name as a code. 
Now we know that is involved in a DNA repair that is also involved in a lysosomal and other types of degradations inside the cell. A, another important mutation a, that causes ALS is mutation in the SOD1 gene. This one was the first gene to be discovered to cause ALS, and after this gene, more than 20 other genes have been identified that have multiple functions. Um, so it has been very hard to establish one single signal pathway to attribute the causes of ALS. Regarding treatments, uh, there are uh, no a lot of options. The patients uh, cannot have a medication that would stop the disease or reverse the progression, but it also, the FDA approved drugs only help with some symptoms. Um, one of those drugs are either a bone, it's an antioxidant that can help with some symptoms, and the other drugs, the other drug is called, uh, is named Rilosol, and it's known to decrease the glutamate levels and extend the life of the patient by three months. As you may imagine, since this disease has pretty much no many options for treatment, there are a lot of research going on. Uh, one of the new alternatives is called NORON, that is an undifferentiated stem cells from the same patients of bone marrow. And these cells are modified to boost the production of neurotrophic factors around the neurons that are dying to support them. And it has been shown that this uh, treatment had and reversed the disease. But of course, it's in initial clinical trial, so it's gonna, if it works, it's gonna have a lot of time until it actually it's uh, prescribed to patients. And another very promising, promising technique is based on gene silencing. And I'm very uh, proud to know because uh, this technique was developed at UMass Medical School with a, a former director of my department, Dr. Brown, as you can see him here. He uh, and his team developed a, a gene silencing technique that target SOD1 gene. So when we have a mutated SOD1 gene, this uh, technique is gonna uh, reduce the levels of the mutated protein which has been shown to ameliorate the symptoms in mice and also uh, reduce the loss of motor neurons in non-primates. So it's very promising. But again, it's not, it has not, cannot be prescribed to uh, patients yet. Uh, you may have heard before, like a couple of years back, there was a huge movement, movement uh, called ALS Pocket Challenge to increase the awareness of this disease because there is, we need to do a lot of research about it. There is very few that is known and we still need uh, treatments for these people. The last neurodegenerative disorder I'm gonna to discuss today is called Huntington's disease. This disease affects 30,000 of Americans and is one of the most common hereditary brain disorders. Uh, differently from the others that we have discussed, there it has a, a strong genetic component. So we know the specific cause of the disease and we know that is hereditary. It has an onset of the symptoms in around the 30s or the 40s, but it, there, uh, there is also a juvenile form that affects people in the 50 to the 20 years old. Uh, this People uh, usually die 50 to 20 years after the symptoms onset, and by the time they, they are in their uh, 50s to 60s. It affects mainly the basal ganglia and the cortex, and if you may remember from previous chapters, the basal ganglia affects the voluntary movements, and the cortex, the cognition, the perception, and the memory, so the patients are gonna have problems with these tasks. But what are the symptoms of this disease? Uh, the symptoms are um, early signs such as irritability, emotional changes, uh, involuntary jerking, poor coordination, difficulty with decisions, and learning new information. 
And the later thing, signs are trouble with voluntary movement, like walking, speaking, swelling, and of course they have a problems with cognition as well. The juvenile form of the disease has the same symptoms, but they also have rigidity and drooling, and they can have seizures in 30 to 50% of the cases. They also shown is in some cases impaired reasoning, memory problems, and loss of balance. As I mentioned before, this disease is entirely genetic. It's caused by a mutation in, the, in a gene called the Huntington gene that encodes the Huntington protein. Um, the Huntington mutant variant is dominant, which means that if it's pressed, if one a parent has the copy of the allele, this parent is gonna have the disease. And if it passes to the child, the child is also gonna have the disease. So the, since it's dominant, uh, the person just needs one copy of the allele in order to, have the, to develop the disease. So a person with Huntington's disease have a 25% chance to have a, a child with the same condition. So these, the changes in this uh, gene are an, an abnormal numbers of repeats of a three-part snippet in the DNA. In the DNA, so in the Huntington gene, there is the this snippet of CAG that is repeated. Normally, it's repeated between 10 to 35 uh, times, but when it's more than 35, since 36 up to 120, uh, people starts to develop Huntington's disease. Uh, if uh, with more repetitions of this snippet, you, the symptoms are worse and the onset is earlier. And these um, repetitions cause that the protein has a polyglutamine region and this region is more clumpy. So it clumps and it is gonna disrupt the mitochondrial electron transport change is going to initiate a cascade of neuronal and dysfunction that ultimately cause neuronal death. The Huntington protein also interacts with other proteins involved in signaling, transport, binding to proteins, and protecting the cell from cell destruction. So you can imagine in the, if the protein starts to be clumpy, it lost their functions and it also affects neuronal survival in that way. Uh, regarding research from the tr for treatments for this disease, it has been developed an antisense oligonucleotide drug that is a single strand of chemically modified DNA that is desi designed to interrupt and decrease the mutated form of the Huntington protein. So if we have less mutated form of the protein, we can help to reduce the symptoms of the Huntington pa patients. There is also research to um, find bio biomarkers to be able to diagnose the disease at early stages. So for example, uh, it has been known that tau and neurofilament light change protein are found at eleva elevated levels in the cerebral spinal fluid of uh, these patients. So this could help to early diagnose people with Huntington's disease. So this is the last a uh, neurological disorder that we are going to discuss today. So with this, I are we waiting for your questions next Saturday? I hope you enjoy the talk and keep working hard for the brain bee.